once the sub is, uh, the hatches are closed, no matter what depth you go to, there's no pressure on anyone because the steel hull protects you from any external pressure. But also it's a closed environment. So you have to replace, as people consume the oxygen in the air, you have to replace it with more oxygen, which is what those, those are for. Also, when people exhale, they produce carbon dioxide, and that's, that is removed from the air. So it's, a, so it's a constant process of adding oxygen, removing carbon dioxide. So you would never know you weren't standing outside in terms of either pressure or your breathing. It's just very natural. It's air conditioned, so very comfortable. When the sub surfaces, it gets permission from the boat on the surface to come up. That boat makes sure there's no, no obstructions uh, for the, and it's clear for the submarine to surface. When it surfaces, the sub will be then using high pressure air will, will blow the water out of these tanks and slowly lift itself right up out of the water. And that's the dive process. I went through engineering school. Uh, I went through an MBA. I worked in engineering and then I joined this company in Vancouver that builds, built these deep, deep submergence, submersibles. Uh, they were kind of a world-class company, so I joined them as a development manager. We developed various um, fairly high-tech, very deep submersibles and we operated them too. So when I started, and the people I brought in had a very good background in both engineering development and operating, which is key, if, especially for this type of product. It needs to be operated in a fashion that is highly, highly reliable. You, you, can't, you don't want to turn away 48 people because <laughs> the equipment failed. So. Well, the first uh, group of people came from the same background I did from the deep submergence design and operating area. So we had John Whitney, and who's an engineer. He was sort of labeled as the chief engineer in the process. We had some electrical and uh, some structural people. We used a lot of consultants in, in designing and some of the um, specialized framework on the sub and the steel hull itself. Uh, we used interior design consultants to make it look nice inside, uh, fiberglass consultants to design, help design the look of it and the fairings because when you look at the submarine you're looking at fiberglass fairings over a steel hull. So that's sort of the team that put the thing together. It took two years to, once we had the um, first parts of the money in place, and started the detailed design. It took two years to design and build Atlantis One. So that was, the above, other than raising, what I did, other than raising money, I directed all the engineering and the, and the fabrication. Basically, I coordinated the, a team of people that, that would do the initial design and then the, the we do very elaborate and finite element analysis. So. It wasn't that I personally designed the, the hull or anything. I just helped direct the, the, the very specialists that we needed to do it. I, I guess the first thing would be to become an expert in the field that you're interested in. And to do that, you really should eventually try to get to work with work your way through the through the type of business you would be interested in. Ideally get to work with people who are experts in the field long enough till you really you really were an expert and the reason for that I think is that it's a very competitive world and if you go out into a business you need to have learned major mistakes somewhere else because you can't afford to make mistakes when you're on your own with limited. The other part of it is that you need credibility to raise money. And the main part is that you need to know 
a lot about the business so that you know who to hire and what kind of people to bring into the business because that's what's going to make or break it. So I guess that's a little bit of advice I would have.